So, I have a, a, an hour or so, hour and five minutes to talk to us about intentional strategies. Intentional strategies. Being intentional. Reinforcing high impact strategies for student success. Last month, or the last time I was with you, we had the opportunity to talk about gradual release of responsibility. We also, Mr. Silva, talked about Hattie and gradual release of responsibility. And Hattie and effect size, right? So we, we wanted to talk about, we have to be intentional. When we're talking about equity, considering students who are gifted and talented, students who are average, students who have disabilities, students who are EL, uh, Ms. Zanida, that we are intentional about using high impact instructional strategies. Why? Student success. Leveling the playing field for all students despite the hand he or she was dealt. ADHD, inability to hear or see or whatever, that we as leaders are, whenever we walk into these classrooms, Ms. Turner, that we are making sure that teachers are doing what's best for those students too, not just limited to our regular ed kids. So in our school, in our strategic plan 2022, um, Colonel Hill, we know that we use the word all. <laughs> and if we truly considering all, we have to consider all that pop of our population, all 17,000 of our students. Okay? A repeat. So, gradual release have several components, such as. How have we utilized graduate release in our buildings? Um, I do, you do, we do in our classrooms for teachers to uh, allow the students to say it with them and then eventually go, with it, go on their own. Thank you. So what's another word for I do, Ms. Jason? Teacher does. Well, the, the teacher is the direct teaching of the... I do. That, yes. Yes, but what's a, that's correct. But what is another word for I do? Model. Direct model. Direct instruction or model or <coughs> focus, right? Focus instruction, right? Mm -hmm. And that is the students are sitting and doing what? Listen. Receiving, absorbing what the teacher is disclosing or laying out, right? Guiding, right? The students do it with assistance from the students do it with assistance from the teacher. A, B, C, one, two, three. One, two, three, D, E, F. Right? We are chunking. We're not putting the entire whopper in our mouth, right? But we are take biting a chunk. We chew it up for understanding. We digest. We take another. Now the, the whopper is no longer, right? We fully understand, okay? And just a metaphor, right? So as I proceed, I want to do a check-in, so a guided practice. We also have what else? Independent. Independent learning. What is that? Students demonstrate their master. Students demonstrate their mastery, okay? How do they do that, uh, Kevin? How? How can, just an example, you know, just an example, how, does, how can a student demonstrate? Completing a task <coughs> or an assignment, such as reading, homework, formative assessments, gives who the opportunity to see what the adolescent knows? The adult, the teacher, okay? All right, so I played it off long enough now. I have markers. All right, um, um, what I would like for you to do, Mr. Turner, is get up out of your seat and move yourself. Now, I, I have some um, <laughs> uh, um, posters on the wall here, and I want you, as well as the L, this thing up here, and I want you to answer these questions, and I do not want Colonel Hill to answer all of them, right? So I want you guys to be equitable in your writing, right? In your contribution, right? Go. Oh. 
The question is, or the statement was, for you to define formative assessment. And when I look at it, so, you know, at these different definitions of it, I say that you're right on track. And I'm very, very proud of you as it relates to this pre-assessment that you just completed, right? To give me some data as to the, your level of understanding on a large scale, not as an individual, because I don't know who wrote that, who did not write, right? But when I see assessment for learning, gives information to the teacher, did the students learn what I taught, the data will let them know, quick checks on current learning for targets, assessments during learning, right? So teaching and learning is not over. It is still what? Ongoing process. It's ongoing process. It is still happening, right? So then I ask a question, are learning targets formative? And Mr. Matt Foster stated to the group as I pass through, as long as they are measurable. Well, learning targets should be aligned. Our learning targets are simply excerpts from, from where, Mr. Moreno? From the standards. Written in blank friendly terms. Student. Student friendly terms. <laughs> <laughs> Student friendly terms, right? So learning targets. Some say learning targets. Some teachers may say goals. Some may say the purpose of the lesson today. We'll call those synonyms, right? So learning, how, who? Who can tell me and explain to me how learning targets are formative? And think of Bogowski, Bogowski as he explains it. Go ahead and So um, we have spoken a little bit about during classroom lessons, many uh, teachers are supposed to have a learning target for that lesson. So by the end of the lesson, students will be able to, and that's stated in the objective. And so teachers have to do constant formative checks to see which percentage of their students know or don't know or are able to do or not do what teachers expected them to do in the objective. So they're formative throughout each lesson, which is why in EM4 we have the ACI, and teachers are encouraged to meet with students who have not met. So teachers may have to do formative checks three to four times in a lesson. They may luck out and not have to do it after one time, but they at least have to do it to see where children are. Very good. Jesse? I was just going to say, I think it also has to do with making it formative, is that it's usually a piece of a standard, which is more than summative. Yes. So you're constantly checking on the pieces to get to the whole. Is that word known as chunking? Chunking. Yes, It is a we do. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Absolutely. You guys are awesome. So um, how, what, what is the correlation between the learning targets and Bogowski? Uh, um, or do we remember the theory of Bogowski and proximity or whatever, whatever, the, uh, zone of proximity. Zone, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scaffold. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you a clue. It's, it's, it's eight, the class starts at 8 o'clock, but the class ends at 9 o'clock. So now it's 8 o'clock. <coughs> it's 8.15. It's 8.22. It's 8.35, it's 8.44, it's 9 o'clock. What, what are those along the way? Yes? They're checkpoints. They're checkpoints along the way, right? Because, because, if this is the target right here, right? Zones, right? But at 8 o'clock, the kid is hitting the learning target right here. I'm not even on the, I'm not even on it, right? This is my level of understanding out here. But as the teacher delivers some instruction, now, mate, I'm at least right here, Campos. I, at 8.15, when I check in after giving that focus instruction, that direct instruction, now I'm right here, right? I have done what? I have, I'm closer to the what? Target. Target. How does that apply to Bogowski? Yes. What I can do what I can do with help, what I can't do. Yes, in order to hit the zone of proximity. Right there, that's what we want to be. Yes, I agree. So the cook, the cook is tasting the soup along the way. Tasting the soup along the way. Carry me my 
the schoolhouse rock. <laughs> Here's another way of looking at that. The summative Oakdale, the summative Cook, the summative Hyde Park Glenwood McCall is Disney World. But you leave Waukegan on I-94, but on your way to Disney World, you stop and take a key. And daddy or mother pops the hood, checks the the oil, right? Look at the windshield fluid, right? The the dad looks and looks at the tires and to see if they need air or not. What is daddy doing or mom doing along the way to Disney World? What about that? I have just done what? Prevention of, of the misconceptions. But I have just what? Oh, formative assessment. So the summative is where? Disney World. Disney World. But I'm just saying take the key. Right? We might yell out the window at Dr. Marcus Alexander and keep rolling her. is my ordeal for the remainder of my time. We see feedback, feed forward, and feed up. Feedback is the most common one that we all talk about. As a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Turner Foster, no, it should be descriptive feedback too, right? Because we know well, why, what's the purpose of getting feedback? Huh? Improve what? To let them know where you are in your learning as it relates to hitting the intended learning target. learning target, which is ultimately the standard. Okay? All right. Along the way, check it. But I taught it. But I taught it, right? But I taught it. I'll lose all these for it's gone. All right. So here we are. This right here, continue. But the teacher assess you on Friday, right there. But when the teacher gets her grades, she realizes or he realizes that 60% of the kids fail because, because the wheels fell off the bus right in there. <coughs> How would the teacher know that the wheels fell off right in there? They if they were what? Assessing. Assessing. What is that assessment called? Checkpoint. Checkpoint. Formative. Progress monitoring, checking for understanding, they're all brothers and sisters. They're the same. Citizen. Abbott. Citizen Elmer. Juarez. Webster. They're the same. You, as the leader, have to ensure that these non negotiable practices are occurring in your building. You. The point that Kevin Wayne is trying to make is, Mr. Knighton, we already know what works best, but we run from it. Because someone put something on Twitter, and not to say all things are bad, but as Daniel said earlier, which was valid, right? How we really check in to see if it works, or if someone just told us, right? How do we know? Evidence-based leadership is your friend. When we talk about evidence-based leaders, it is, it is when we hold the people that we serve to a higher level of scrutiny. We hold them to a higher level of scrutiny. Why? Because who are we concerned about? Who walks through our doors every day? Kids. And we have to be accountable. And it is, I think, or I feel is good sometimes, but more importantly, we have to have some evidence of where they are, what they know, what they don't know, or what they partially know, and how are we to behave. Are there any questions about Madeline Hunter? Let's roll. <laughs> what about Ms. Pickerel? What stands out for you? What stands out in this article? What what stands out? Um, I think this is a review of what we all know that it, what it is. Um, good instruction and you check for understanding and you teach 
soap. It's what he said about the soap. Yes. <laughs> Who wants to add more? Yes, sir. I mean, obviously the emphasis on the value of chunking a lesson, but more importantly, assessing students after each chunk of the lesson resonates with me. Yes. Yes, Mr. Terry. I like the word says that uh, as Coach Wooden found the real creativity rides with the culture where people can master fundamentals. Master fundamentals, right? Intentional. Yes, ma'am. I say even like the backward design. What's the big picture in that? What's the big picture of the backward design? The what? <clears throat> The end goal. This, have you ever heard this? Standards are meaningless. Standards don't define anything. Right? Or standards don't define rigor, is the, is the way I'm going to say. Standards do not define rigor. What defines rigor? Huh? Yes. Well, in my opinion, differentiation is extremely important when it comes to rigor because students have different levels in the class. Yes, but they but they are at different levels based on the standards, right? Which standard gen? Yeah. But it, it happens in the planning phase. Planning and teaching. Defines what? It's the thinking. It's the planning and teaching. Planning and teaching defines the rigor because they they have to. Playing the process backwards. Backwards! Step! No, you're cooking! Uh, yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's the end. I am. It's the end. Like Todd Wiggins, right? Understanding back by design. Larry Ainsworth. So, what we do, Foster, what we should do first, what we should do, assessments define rigor. Paul Bamberg Santorium, 2012. Assessments define rigor. So what we should do is create our assessments before August. Yes. This is what? Thank you. <laughs> Could you take your stripes off? <laughs> Could you take your stripes off? Yes, that should. But we, what, we, what, what do we call those? Uh, <laughs> interim. All right, that the interim assessments. Exactly. But up under that, CFAs, right? That's aligned to interim assessments, right? So CFAs at a lower level, right? That should be happening, creating the IOTs or your PLCs that's aligned to, right? So if the teachers created the assessment first, they already know, Cabrina, what they're going to test the kids on in four weeks. Correct. Assessments define rigor. Standards alone are meaningless. Correct. Assessments define rigor. If you create them first, you know that you're going to test kids on algebraic relations. You know this, that they have to know why. Because you and Ms. Baranowski and Colonel Hills and Nelson, over the summer, y'all put these tests together. Based on these standards, scope and sequence, all got to be in place too. And mapping, right? <laughs> okay, all right. So that's that. Moving on. What Mike Smoker points out here is that we already know what works. And there aren't any tricks. The people who invented Google and, 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 and Gates and all, they learned like we did. They learned off the chalkboard. Right? I will never say that technology is important. It is. If we use that Chromebook, they went large. Every kid got a device for like 800 bucks. No covering. Now, one teacher had been trained. They were still using them like the chalkboard. They didn't know. They didn't know. So you dump all this money, but you haven't enhanced the skill set and the capacity of the people who stand in front of the students. So they can utilize the new device <coughs> differently. Until we do that, the technology or the advances that we see are fragmented at best, right? So I am working with Mr. Josue, uh, and, and we're working on that, right? We're now infinite stages, but we are working on that. So, formative assessments, purpose, 
goals, targets. Learning targets, we've talked about. Check it for understanding, we've already talked about. We haven't even hit this slide yet. Feedback and clarity. One of your number one jobs as administrators is to provide clarity. <coughs> back here in the back, I ask you a question. Right back here. Why do we need to clarify, re-clarify, and re-re-clarify? Why? Why? <laughs> if something is unclear, to remove misconceptions, to remove misconceptions, what else? False perception. To increase the likelihood that that you meet the intended target. target. You want to clarify. You know what the worst thing, especially in Charlie Danielson, it was like a a a, a yucky, right? Whenever a teacher has given direct or focus instruction for 15, 20 minutes, and she says, are there any questions? Thumbs up to the side down. Zero. You may know. <laughs> <laughs> like 10 hands go up. What's wrong with that? Clarify. Clarify. Didn't I do what? Clarify. Because if 10 hands go up after you just stood up in front of somebody, <coughs> right? And I'm not a big fan of up to the side and down for checking for understanding. I am a gut bucket person. I want to answer the question. We know that kids learn patterns, and they know that this is all he's going to do, and then we're going to move on. Let's say yeah, right? Yeah. So I really, really want to know if the adolescent or if the baby truly know it, okay? Silence your cell phones, laptop, put them down. You're already done, so you're learning it. Uh, please be attentive, right? Supportive. Now, six. Formative six. assessment. Read it. Um, <laughs> Look at the white letters, but look at it all. <laughs> Questions? What stands out? They just provide clarity for you. Right? Who is it talking to? Who's doing this adjusting? Who's adapting? Based on what? Students. students. How students are responding, how they progress, progress monitored, how they check for understanding, right? This is, how many of you heard of Dylan Williams, 1L? Yes, very good. All right, um, um, not just Hattie, Smoker, Marzano, we talk about the point four being the average effect side that we're looking for, right? Then we have these. High effect size. Where's feedback up there? 775. Which one of those up there can represent clarity? Just talk about it at your table. It's more than one. Which one can represent clarity? Where's checking for understanding in there? Where's clarity? Up on the wall, up on the uh, <coughs> screen, which one of these is, is clarity? Talk to me. Student self-assessment. Huh? Student self-assessment. Student self-assess. Not quite. Success criteria. What, how is it clarity? Success criteria. You're explaining to the students what they need to know. And when you explain to them, you should do what? To get sure they know it. Check for understanding. All right, anything else? Yes? Classroom discussions? So, as a result of the teacher seeing the kids discuss, how does the teacher use that to clarify if the students are talking about uh, the appropriate material or has the intended outcome, they've reached the learning target. It is. It becomes clear to the teacher Correct. that kids may understand what she he or she wants. Anyone else? What about micro-teaching? I think if you've done the um, checkpoints along the way, you might need to reteach something. But, but okay, micro-teaching. What is micro-teaching? Let's define it. Whenever you were studying for Gangton, you had to watch a whole lot of what? Videos. Yeah. Videos, okay? A whole lot of videos and calibration, right? So, 
Here we are. What about this one? Why is this one so high? What's a, what's a synonym for the word estimate? Expectations. Expectations. Look at that. Look at that red turn. Look at it. Look what they're saying. So where does this happen, though? In planning. In planning. In planning. <laughs> In planning. Why do you say that, uh, Glenwood? Um, I say that because that's where you plan your lessons according to what you expect from your students. The and rigor that you're gonna have in it. And you're also looking at your kids' what level? Their readiness level. Okay. And your ILTs or your PLCs, right? So I have estimates, I have expectations, I have some idea <laughs> of what my kids know. Well, sometimes it's assumptions, which is the problem. So. Why? Because if you have low expectations based on anything other than data, you sometimes underestimate. You underestimate. You have low expectations. Yes. So the other day, last week, I went into a classroom and I saw first for me in two years, I was walking around groups of students doing arithmetic work, and two students had different work in front of them, and I've never seen that in my building, and I'm like, it was higher level arithmetic because these two are the highest level learners in the class, uh -huh. and it's a brand new teacher, so we celebrated them in the staff exactly. meetings. Yeah. I said I would love to see this throughout, throughout my building because <laughs> teachers think that differentiation oh, is something else. Yes. I think it's, well, I have less expectations. I, I, I have less expectations on the same assignment, so therefore I'm differentiating. But true differentiation is doing what he was doing. To where they are, right? With yeah. level rigor. I saw something. Just my hand something. Yes. I was just going to say, a cultural responsive practices. What about it? Can help um, accelerate uh, high, S, um, high achievements for your students. Because you're considering a kid's culture, culture right? Race matter, right? All right, uh, 1.6 micro teaching. Feed up. Point 0.56. Right Did y'all get it right? <laughs> A clear purpose, clarity. When students understand, <laughs> Colonel, when students understand, Odell, when students understand, they are more likely to focus on the learning task at hand. Here we go in red. Who? Establishing a purpose is also crucial to feedback systems because when teachers have a what clear overall purpose, they can align their various assessments. Here's. Can I ask a question? How, if I'm just explaining this to my teacher, would you would you differentiate feed up from giving the students an objective or learning target if it has all the measures and evidence? What's the difference between? Uh, because both should be valid. Both should what's be the difference between feed? What's the difference between feed up and planning and learning targets? Look at it. Providing the feedback. But what's the difference? What's the goal? What's the purpose? But if you're writing an objective. So what's the purpose measure, of the objective? Well, if you're writing an objective to learn that day. Why? What's the purpose so of the students what? understand where oh, they're going. Okay, stop. So what is this saying? You use the feedback to do something. Huh? Is it the same? Yes. What is it saying? It's the same. Zero How do you know it's the same? Because they're both establishing clear purpose. A clear purpose. And what does the, and what should the objective should do? be clear purpose with, okay. with a goal All right. assessment. All right. But the clear purpose has to be established for good feedback, valuable feedback to be given. Yes. But if we just put learning targets, so this is Hattie and Tim Temperley Research 2008. However, um, um, what, what they're saying is the same thing as um, learning targets. Do you give feedback to learning targets? You should. It's one of the yes. 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 Right? You should. Once you uh, ask the question, if a kid doesn't know it, we, we clarify it, right? We continue, right? So feed up. Feed, feed up. Establishing a purpose. Learning target. Goals. We're establishing a what? A purpose, right? So if our purpose is to learn multiplication, the teacher must do what? 
What are, what are anticipated? the criteria along and, with how you're assessing That's it. right. But what are, what are, and looking at your papers, what is anticipatory sets? Madeline Hunter, effective instruction. What are anticipatory sets? What, what's an anticipatory set? It's in there too. What is it, Nelson? It's a what? Hook. Hook. Hey, go deep. What does that mean? He's correct, but what is a hook? Huh? Them and alert it. Who does it? The teacher. The teacher provides small what? To read it. What does it say? <laughs> A zero. Lotto. So, so to be clear, to be clear, homework should not be graded. But if you want to put a grade on it, silver, it should not be worth more than you will see. Some say two to five percent of the grade. Still giving that kid the opportunity to make a A on the test. Right? Or on the homework. Sometimes we have to do it simply because kids realize that, hey, it's not working the thing. So it's, you don't have to do it, but if you want to trick the game, trick the theory, Rick Ravelli would say that he used it, he, it was only worth 2% to 5% of the 100 on the 100 point scale, right? That's another story. So that way, you have not robbed the kid the opportunity to still be successful in your classroom. You're not in the gutter trying to, to escape. All right? Okay, a short video with Dylan Wade on formative. To me, formative assessment. Here we go. 
describes all those processes by which teachers and learners and it's on your page. use information about student achievement to make adjustments to the students' learning that improve their achievement. So it's about it's about using information to adapt your teaching and adapt the work of the students to put the learning back on track, if you like, to make sure that the learning is proceeding in the right direction and to support that learning. So it's it's, it's what happens when you don't just lecture students and rattle through the material until you get to the end and ask them if they've understood it okay. It's constantly making that, the, those adjustments. One of the ways I like to talk about it is just imagine what would happen if a pilot flew like many teachers are Check this out. So I flew back from Seattle a few, a few weeks ago. Um, just imagine what the pilot would have done. He would have flown east for nine hours and then after nine hours, he says it's time to land. So he, he'll put the plane down and he'll ask, is this London? And of course, even though it's not London, he says, whatever, well, he's got to get off because I've got to get off to the new, across the next journey. And that's exactly... What did he just explain? How, how, how does that happen in the classroom? Huh? They just keep moving forward. They just keep moving forward even though the wheels fell off the bus on Tuesday. Right? They just keep doing what? Going forward, he said, "I flown for nine hours, and then right or the, or we ask, do you understand? Because I've talked for an hour. Do you understand? That's what he's getting at. Do you understand? Right? And the kids don't understand because we haven't done what along the way. Check yeah, for understanding. understanding. Man, actually, the way that we've assessed in the past, we teach students, <laughs> and at the end of that teaching. We find out if they Here don't, we go. and if they haven't, we say, too bad, because we're on to the next unit. <laughs> so what formative assessment does is encourages teachers to take constant readings about where students are, just in the same way that the pilot takes constant readings about their position. And if the learning isn't proceeding as you plan, then you make adjustments. That's the essence to me of formative assessment. They will make what? So the reason why I think that formative assessment is the right focus is because assessment is the bridge between teaching and learning. It's only through assessment of some kind that you know whether what has been taught has been learned. Only through assessment. And that's why I think this focus on this assessment process, minute by minute and day by day, not at the end of a sequence of learning, minute, minute and day by day, allows teachers to reflect on their practice and make small steps in improving that practice. So, who is the formative assessment really for? Teachers. Teachers. Why? To figure out how they're going in relation to who? Very good. You guys are awesome. Unpack informative assessments. Unpack informative assessments. I have uh, like three more. Which skills are college and career ready when we look at this? Of the three, teacher, peer, learning. This unpack informative assessments. Unpack informative assessments. I have uh, like three more. Which skills are college and career ready when we look at this? Of the three, teacher, peer, learning. When a kid goes to college, what must they be able to do? What? I heard it. Learning on their own. Learning on their own, right? As leaders, as teachers, we should be teaching in a way that kids become leaders of their own learning. Learning target. Whenever I go around into your classrooms, I'm not always seeing the teacher reference the learning target. And the learning target is usually over in some corner. I need you to look at this video. What do you see? What stands out? What do you see? What stands out for you as a leader? Quite a bit, and they're looking really good. But what I'm noticing that we need to spend a little more time on are transition words and phrases. So our learning target today is I can use transition words or phrases to connect my paragraphs. Let me read it one more time really slowly. I want you to think about the words you know in here and the words that you're confused about. So I can use transition words or phrases to connect my paragraphs. And now I'd like you to pair up with somebody. 
and talk about what you think of the Look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. Leaders of their own learning. I've been to many of your offices. I've seen this book on your shelf. This is the book that I use today. Leaders of your own learning. I knew what grades were before, but then I kind of forgot. So there's a question about the word grades. Um, I know a lot about transition words. Well, so if you have two different ideas, it's kind of hard to like jump to two of them without them being like it just sounds weird. Yeah, you have to make them like combine together. So you can say like I, I'm also good at it or something like that. Are these things happen in our class <laughs> as it relates to learning target? Well, I know what um, transition words are because I use them a lot on Google Docs. Um, they're like, um, they're like, um, like passing it on to another person, but like with a paragraph. I'd love to hear from a couple other kids before we move on. Jack? I want to answer Sarah's question. I know what a phrase is. Okay. It's like, um, a, if you put like a couple of words together, it makes it just like, yeah. Kind of like a short thing that you would say. Okay, so a couple of words together. Yeah. That's really important because we know that with different grades, you guys have to be pretty exact. At your table, talk about it. One person reports out. Let's go. Learn and target. And they unpack. Uh, who, uh, who's going to report out first about this video and unpacking the standards? And I heard this table, I heard about low hanging fruit and all that. What? A go faster. Come on. We're on film. <laughs> so being, okay, so I'll, I'll go. So being able to, to give the, the kids the opportunity to, to um, turn and talk and, and actually as a teacher hears their conversations they can actually produce a, a, a kind of a mental note of where they need to clarify the misconceptions. When the teacher listens, the teacher is getting a sense of the kids' what? Understanding. Understanding. So the teacher is checking for understanding. Understanding. And we're still in that same ballpark. I love it. Very good. Yes, still, let's roll. <laughs> well, I see, you know, with the problem with instruction, I think, that I deal with. Yes, sir. Is that you know you shared with us the framework for instruction, and the hunter, yes, sir. Um, off the, the design for instruction. I think that teachers have difficulty trying to choose the strategy that they're going to use to um, for the anticipatory set for the instructors to get that to come out. Right. So that students have that conversation with each other, so that they're processing the purpose for learning. I think that's where teachers struggle, that choice of what strategy do I What to do once I get in here? That one's good. This is better. <laughs> no, this is something else. What, what Carol said is about um, the other thing, too, is when the students talk, they mean you aren't talking. So they also have to relinquish um, <coughs> the, being in control. A power. Or, or, yes, know. why is that an issue for teachers, especially for <laughs> Because they're so, want to be controlled, they're so used to being the person that the, the kids are watching and modeling, they're just in that mode. I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> I'm going to do it again, I'm going to do it again, you're going to get it. You're going to never do it. Right. You're get it. So, it's a change mindset. Yes. Yeah. 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 Maybe teachers can use their own threat. Their whole <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Um, with what the clarity is. So they were clarity. on talking, clarity. thinking that that's just clarity by itself. All right. What's your name? Me? Yes, you. <laughs> What's your name? Stephanie, 30. What's your name? Robert. Robert, 60. Amanda. 50. Jennifer. 95. Her students are 30% proficient. His students are... 65% proficient, your students are 50% and her students are 
So, he, Robert said, but they don't know what to do. Guess what the rest of these teachers need to be? Who they need to be working with? Which other? Why? Because she find out what she's doing. To find out what she, all of this, it's these scores on that same standard. Because they met in the planning phase in their professional learning <laughs> room, and they said, we're going to go back to our class, and we're going to teach this. But whenever you go back to your class, you have the autonomy to do what you want to do. And she did what she wanted to do, and she out, her students outperformed. So when they come together and they share, the rest of these should be stealing her ideas <laughs> and going back to her their classroom, right? Yes, yes. yes, sir. You guys have been great. Thank you. <laughs>